Um, welkom allemaal bij alweer de derde en laatste webinar over Salesforce. Vandaag uh, gaan we een deep dive doen op de service accounts en hoe Salesforce kan helpen met het beveiligen van deze. Um, de opbouw is een beetje hetzelfde als de vorige twee. De achterzouwer geeft introductie en de problemen waar de klanten op dit moment tegenaan lopen. En Jerome gaat daar aan de hand van een demo laten zien hoe ze Salesforce daarmee kan helpen en hoe dat ze kunnen voorkomen. Um, nou, mochten er vragen zijn, stop ze, stuur ze vooral in de Q&A box. En dan uh, denk ik dat we hem aan Jasper gaan geven om te beginnen. Oké, okay, top. Dankjewel, Kilian. Uh, ja, zoals gezegd, uh, vandaag spreken we over de service accounts. Um, en dan vooral over uh, hoe Silverford uh, beveiligt van service accounts en non-human identities gaat aanpakken. Te beginnen, uh, misschien belangrijk, waar vinden we service accounts? Uh, eigenlijk overal in het netwerk. Hè. Je ziet hier verschillende uh, categorieën van applicaties. Uh, denk aan backup accounts, denk aan applicaties als Veeam, Rubrik, uh, uh, accounts als ServiceNow. Uh, al die, account, al die uh, applicaties vereisen eigenlijk service accounts om hun acties uh, te gaan kunnen ondernemen. Uh, dit is in principe iets wat je wilt als bedrijf, want door middel van deze service accounts kan je acties gaan automatiseren. Iedereen is fan van meer automatisatie, dus dat wordt zeker ondersteund. Alleen ja, het, het probleem is met een service account dat die vaak een statisch wachtwoord heeft, ook nogal vaak opgeslagen in clear text. Uh, dat men uh, binnen de organisatie geen visibiliteit heeft op de authenticaties die de service account onderneemt. Uh, zoals gezegd, uh, die account heeft heel vaak ook privilege access op een heel groot deel, zo niet het gehele netwerk. En die account is moeilijk te gaan te wijzigen, want dat, deze account is een account die, die vanuit de applicatie komt en, en waarin meestal geen wijzigingen mogelijk zijn in uh, permissions. De risico's die aan die account vasthangen zijn natuurlijk uh, in, uh, hetzelfde als bij een, een human identity is wachtwoorddiefstal. Als het wachtwoord geraden wordt, heel vaak komen deze service accounts met een standaard wachtwoord dat niet altijd gewijzigd wordt, jammer genoeg. Maar toch heel belangrijk om dat in de gaten te houden. Die service accounts kunnen ook heel vaak misbruikt worden voor de lateral movement en rechtenverhoging van andere accounts. Door hun karakteristiek, door het feit dat zij... Uh, heel veel echte hebben, kunnen zij dit gaan doen. Um, het account en het paswoord wordt vaak gedeeld binnen, met verschillende mensen, soms binnen, binnen verschillende afdelingen. Ik denk dan bijvoorbeeld aan een ServiceNow account, uh, waar, waar uh, misschien verschillende niveaus van helpdesk toegang toe moeten hebben en dergelijke. Uh, dus het is een vaak gedeeld paswoord. Uh, het account wordt vaak overgenomen. En eh, ja, zoals gezegd, je hebt geen visibiliteit op deze account of waar ze inlogt. Nu, je kan dat gaan aanpakken via een PAM, via een Vault. Um, hiervoor zijn er enkele vereisten. Zo moet er een redundante Vault worden opgezet. Gaat men wachtwoorden roteren en heeft men vaak agents nodig. Uh, het is vaak een tijdlovend proces en het creëert een single point of failure. Uh, we hebben al langs nog bij Uber bijvoorbeeld gezien wat de gevolgen zijn indien die klaas gekraakt wordt. Um, een, een ander uh, probleem vaak bij een PAM-oplossing is dat uh, dit een heel lange deployment tijd heeft. Uh, hoewel dat, uh, de oplossing op zich een, een goede oplossing is, wordt er vaak, uh, zijn PAM-projecten vaak een project van heel lange adem door middel van hun architectuur en wordt enkel gekeken naar de koningwereld. Nu op zich is dat eh, niet echt een probleem, alleen het wordt wel een probleem als men niet de hele omgeving kan gaan beveiligen en daardoor toch service accounts in het netwerk laat die niet in de pan zitten, door middel van eh, omdat dit een, een lange duur heeft qua installatie, en dat die accounts dan misbruikt worden om rechtenverhoging te gaan doen. 
Uh, ook vaak uh, is er toch wel een risico voor een vendor login, uh, omdat uh, heel vaak een brandoplossing een niet standaard API gebruikt. Dan gaan we kijken hoe doen we dat met Silverford. Uh, door middel van onze architectuur zien we eigenlijk alle accounts, onafhankelijk van applicatie integratie, omdat ook deze accounts zich gaan authenticeren op het IDP. Uh, zodra de accounts door het IDP gaan, gaan we hier onze bescherming. Toepassen. Die bestaat uit vier stappen voor service accounts. Het eerste punt is de automatische indexatie en klassificatie van die accounts. Service accounts worden automatisch herkend door middel van onze machine learning. Het tweede punt is de analyse en alerting van nieuwe service accounts. Dus zodra dat zelfs een nieuwe service account herkent, ga je daar in het dashboard een overzicht van krijgen. Het derde punt is de AI monitoring die automatisch gaat alerten als een service account een ongebruikelijke actie onderneemt. Ik denk bijvoorbeeld aan een interactive login. Dat is iets dat een service account per definitie eigenlijk niet mag doen. Dus zodra dat er iets gebeurt dat een service account niet kan doen of niet mag doen in principe, gaan we daar een alert op geven. Het vierde punt, en waarschijnlijk het belangrijkste punt, is het beperken van de toegang. Dus ondanks, dat we, ondanks het feit dat we met een privileged account werken, kunnen we toch de toegang gaan beperken tot enkel de strikt noodzakelijke systemen. Zo kunnen we ervoor zorgen dat indien een service account wordt overgenomen door een, uh, door een andere partij, zij enkel toegang kunnen krijgen tot hetgeen wat die service account voor bedoeld is en niet die account kunnen gaan misbruiken voor lateral movement binnen het netwerk of bijvoorbeeld rechtenverhoging bij andere accounts. Um, dat zijn vier eh, heel belangrijke punten, vooral die laatste punten. Daarmee gaan we eigenlijk lateral movement gaan elimineren. Um, de volgende vraag is heel vaak natuurlijk van eh, hoe dat werkt. Eh, over hoe dat werkt, daarvoor ga ik net als bij de twee vorige webinars graag het woord geven aan Jerome. Jerome, it's all yours. Thanks very much. So let me quickly change the presenter here. All right. So. Oops, sorry. Screen. All right, very good. Um, so, yeah, uh, just like the two other webinars, uh, the second part is going to be in English. I still haven't learned Dutch, um, but uh, bear with me. So, um, how, how does this thing work? How do we protect service accounts uh, from a technical perspective? Just a, a quick overview. So, um, what you can see here on the top left is actually the non-human accounts that are in the environment and then on the top right the resources so that might be a backup service account for example trying to reach um, the um, file server uh, to perform its backup or it might be a software distribution service account that uh, tries to push out software to endpoints anything like that so um, at some point that service account will try and reach the resource and for that it will create an authentication request towards the Active Directory using the, the protocol that um, uh, is, has been uh, designed for that service account or for that application uh, to work with. So that could be Kerberos, LMTLM, SAML, and so on. Um, now, what happens is that every single time the, the backup server, for example, wants to access this, the uh, authentication request is being sent to the IEP. So it's not just uh, once, but every single time that access is made, an authentication request is sent. Now what Silverfort does is we have a component that sits inside the Active Directory, and that will um, see that service, uh, that, sorry, that service account authentication request come in. It will hold it, and it will then to, uh, do two things. The first one is, um, it will do a real-time risk analysis. So we apply roughly 45 different risk factors um, that can be things that, uh, that, that we see, that we know, peaks in authentication requests, for example, uh, so that we can see potential brute force attempts. Or it can also be uh, things based on the behavior of the account. If the backup service account every single time 
logs in at 2 a.m. in the morning to the file server, and now suddenly it logs in in the middle of the day and it comes from a different source, for example, that raises a behavior-based um, risk. And then we attach that uh, risk scoring for the account and we can apply policy based on the risk scoring. And the other thing that we do is real-time protection, which is ring fencing. Um, so unlike in the previous webinars where we see how we protect internal resources by applying MFA, the service accounts, you don't want to apply MFA. Nobody wants to get up at 2 a.m. in the morning um, to allow the backup to run. So, so what we're doing here is um, what we call the ring fencing, which means that we can restrict that service account to only authenticate from specific sources to specific destinations. And staying with the example of the service account, what that means is um, uh, that backup service account should only be coming from the backup server and should only be going to the file server or the three file servers that your customers have in, in their environment. And it shouldn't be able to authenticate from a different source or to a different destination. And that's exactly what we can enforce in a very, very simple uh, way. Uh, we can create a policy that would say, um, actually, if we detect all the sources and destinations, and then and I'll, I'll show that to you, that is service accounts use. And then you can say, okay, so from now on, the backup service account, we enforce that it can only log in from the um, uh, backup server to the file service as a destination. So this is really a very straightforward and lightweight solution to implement because it doesn't require any change. Let me go to the advantages here. So first of all, we haven't deployed any proxies or agents. Um, the backup server doesn't know we exist. The file server doesn't know we exist. Even the service account doesn't know we exist. So, so there's nothing to deploy between the um, service account source and its destination uh, or on any of those servers. So that gives you a very straightforward experience in terms of um, yeah, the deployment itself and, and the speed. Um, there's also no changes for um, anybody uh, using those services. Um, you know, service accounts are not just backup accounts. It can be a web server, for example, that runs on a service account. There's no change uh, whatsoever um, for users or, or accounts. The other thing, since we see all of the authentications happening, we actually lock all of those authentications and we can forward those to CM systems so that the SOC can look at it. And at the same time, like I stated before, we create that risk scoring based on the four to five different risk indicators. So, so that visibility is, is drastically risen. And it's not just um, uh, the uh, visibility into um, uh, the authentications, but also just you know, understanding which accounts are used for services is something that we provide automatically. And it's something that not all of the organizations that we work with know. Um, just because you know, business needs to happen fast. And even though when they start off, they're very organized, they make uh, segregation, every service account has just one particular task and, and they have specific naming conventions. But then, um, you know, they, they very often have to implement stuff really quick and they just use the admin account for that particular service and say, okay, I'll, I'll change that later. But that just never happens. So we also see those hybrid types of accounts that are being used for services, but are actually user accounts, admin accounts, for example. I spoke a little bit about the implementation already. So since there's just a component on uh, the Active Directory on the domain controller and um, uh, two VMs to deploy, the implementation is very, very fast. If you compare that to the traditional approach where you have uh, projects that run over a year, over two years, and which require a uh, heavy change in the infrastructure um, with um, deployment of um, scripts with changing of applications with vaults and password rotation. Um, this implementation is really, really long and really fast. I spoke about the ring fencing, so real time blocking. It's not just monitoring, it's not just visibility, it's not just giving you um, the view after the fact. It is actually protecting systems in real time. And then again, um, we don't need to change anything. We have um, 
everything in place with our VMs and the um, domain controller um, add-on component, nothing else is needed, which implicitly means there's no real vendor lock-in here. We don't change anything in the infrastructure. So um, when, you, when you remove us, you don't need to change anything back in the infrastructure. So that's also um, uh, yeah, a very good uh, topic to, to talk about to your customers. Um, there is no lock-in being done here. Good. So with that, let me switch and move to a demo. So the first thing that I'd like to show you is our management console. And then I'll go into uh, kind of a live demonstration of uh, how a service account can be misused and how we, can, how we can protect from that. So what you can see here is our management console. I went over that um, in, in the two last um, webinars. And uh, if you've joined those webinars, what I've said was on, on the uh, initial management screen, you see all the authentications happening. What I didn't say is that it's also service account authentications, non-human account authentications that are happening in real time here. What you don't see with service accounts is nothing will go up on service accounts here because they're not verified with MFA, but some of those will go down here um, because they're being blocked because they come from sources that are not allowed or go to destinations that are not allowed. So the first thing that we do is an inventory, uh, and that's automatic. You don't have to do anything for that. Since we see the authentications come in, um, we can then deduct an inventory. We can uh, automatically see which of those authentications belong to uh, non-human accounts. So that's something that you can see here on the, on the bottom left, where are my service accounts? And obviously there's a lot of detail on that. So here's the list of service accounts that we identify automatically without uh, having anything to do so uh, from, from the end user side. Um, and we do that very accurately. We look at naming conventions that you actually can configure. Um, we look at uh, groups that are used where you put service accounts in, but we also apply some intelligence here, some AI, um, to see the um, uh, authentication behavior, for example, where we can deduct very accurately that this is actually a service account. And then we can show you things, for example, a service account that allow interactive login. So, so there are hybrid. We can show you um, service accounts that we see uh, potential brute force uh, attacks on, and so on. As I said earlier, we provide also um, a lot more detail on that, and, and I'll go into that in a bit in terms of the risk analysis. And you now I can uh, filter here, for example, and look at, okay, uh, here's the service account that um, we have seen a, a brute force attempt on, uh, as an example. So and I'm, I'm not on the um, enforcement part of things yet, but still, you know, it would be uh, very good to see what led us to that conclusion. So here's all the um, authentications that we've seen from that service account. So we can go into a very deep level of detail. We see uh, a number of risk indicators here, a number of sources and destination the service account is actually using, probably more than it should be using. And uh, from there, we can uh, deduct all sorts of things and, and, and make sure that this uh, service account actually does what it's supposed to do. Um, here's uh, one way of identifying service accounts, um, allowing you to uh, give your own naming convention. So it's not us um, deciding on that. It's actually your customers that can decide on that. And on top of that, just like I said, we have that AI component that will very accurately determine this. And, and we can look at the different service account here, for example, and we see the authentication behavior of that service account. So, you know, this is pretty clear that this is a machine logging in. If you look at the behavior, uh, same time uh, of the day and a very um, you know, standardized or machine type of authentication behavior. And we see a little peak here. So that's probably something we want to investigate. And since this is my backup service account, it might just be that, um, you know, the backup didn't run or uh, somebody changed the password and it's done a, a number of attempts, or it might actually do a brute force attack or some, some other type of attack running here. So it's, it, it, this visibility that we provided here makes it very easy to understand what's actually happening in the environment for more human accounts. So um, how do we enforce this thing? For that, let's look at a very simple example where um, 
we'll go to, we'll take a service account. So I have a, you know, a workstation here that's pretty standard. And let's assume I'm, I'm an attacker. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and figure out credentials for such an account. Why? Because service accounts um, are, um, you know, usually have pretty high privileges and they never change their password. So I can go on the dark net and, 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 and try and figure out um, the uh, credentials of the service or buy service account credentials there, or I can just um, look into scripts that admins have made in, in the network that I've already uh, got into, and you know, a bunch of other methods. At the end of the day, I come up with a set of credentials that uh, I might want to use um, to actually penetrate the network even more and, and, and get to other resources inside that network. So the example that I've uh, been making here is that I'm, I'm on uh, a machine which is called ACAWS RD61, and um, I'm, I'm just going to try and uh, open up a command line using a service account here with uh, a password that I've gotten from somewhere. And so by default, that's something that I just can do, right? Let me go here, right? So. Now I'm on a different machine. Right? So that's usually not something you want the service account to be misused for. Um, and so with Silverfort, uh, what we can do here is we, we take that exact same service account that I've been using in the example and we enforce a policy. So what does that policy do? It actually is very simple. It will say, okay, I've seen this service account logging in from those two different sources. And I've seen this service account going into or, or as a destination using these different um, resources here. So since I know this is, let's say again, my backup service account should only come from um, the file server, so the backup server and go to the file server. That's it, that's all it should be doing. Right? It shouldn't go from um, one endpoint to the other, which is what I've shown in the example. So now I'm enforcing this. I'm just saying, okay, um, let's uh, allow this service account to use the backup server. Let's allow this as a source. Let's allow this service account to use the file server as a destination and block access for everything else. I could have done that uh, using the risk level as well. I could have said, um, well, this service account can basically use anything. Um, but based on the risk that we identify, we will block. And, and that uh, probably makes more sense, uh, for example, for software distribution service account, which is used um, for every endpoint. You know, the destination has to be every single endpoint in the organization. So you don't want to list every single endpoint here. Um, that's not really the purpose of this. But uh, you want to say this is, uh, should be coming from one source, going to all destinations, but only if the risk is at a certain level. If it goes beyond that, then we won't allow the service account to distribute software because it is it has been compromised. Anyway, so we've enforced this rule. So what happens now is I'm going to do the same thing again. And as you can see, this thing is going to time out. And it's going to give me a weird error message if I'm doing this at the command line. You know, if it's really a service, it doesn't really matter. But it now says that username or password are incorrect. And Sorry, I am still on the same machine. The system didn't allow me to move somewhere else. And we can actually see that in our logs. So let me go to the logs here real quick. We don't have to go into too much detail here, but we've seen here that the access has been denied. So that service account here uh, was not allowed by policy, which is actually something that we can look at here as well, was not allowed to access that resource. So in summary, um, we have a very, very lightweight mechanism to add that additional layer of protection to service accounts. We've seen how we protect user accounts in previous webinars, privileged accounts and standard user accounts. And the same thing applies to service accounts, the same concept, the same technology, just instead of using MFA, we use ring fencing. And with that, I am going to give it back to uh, Jasper. Um, are there any questions? We should, we're running out of time here, but if there are any questions, we can potentially take one oh. or two. 
uh, don't see any uh, right now unless there's still one coming in. Uh, so I'll give it like another minute or so, maybe if there is another question coming in. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, uh, just uh, want to expand maybe a bit on what Jerome said. Uh, yeah, uh, as, as you can see, like yeah, the, throughout the series uh, of webinars, I think the, the ID, I hope the ID came across. Um, what Silverford essentially is, is a, a very lightweight solution inside of your network that provides a lot of identity protection. Um, we've heard customers refer to this as the identity firewall, if you will. Uh, you, you, in, you inspect on a traditional firewall, you inspect network traffic. On Silverford, you inspect identity traffic um, and, and you apply a rule on it uh, that's allowed in I or MFA. It's as simple as that. Um, it's as simple as that to implement it as well. Uh, I, I hope that's clear. Um, and it brings a lot of uh, options to your customers and a lot of uh, additional security to your customers. Also, if you have an IAM vendor or if you have a PAM vendor already in your portfolio, <clears throat> it is important to know uh, we do not compete with these solutions. We are not an IAM vendor. We are not a PAM vendor. These solutions have absolutely a right to exist. Uh, we, we have integrations with, with many of them, uh, just uh, Ping, Okta, just in, to name a few. Um, so I, I think it's very important uh, to keep that in mind as well when, when you consider adding this to your portfolio. Um, do not look at us as a competition for those solutions. Look at us as an add-on, look at us as a way for your customer to help expand their investment into that IAM, into solutions that that IAM might not be able to reach, uh, stuff like that. Um, that's it. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think I, I want to thank everybody, uh, especially the people that attended all three of these webinar series. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, our our uh, emails are on the screen. And uh, yeah, happy to hear uh, further along if there are still any questions or if you would like to know more. Killian, uh, maybe if you want to still say something. Well, dat is hetzelfde als wat jij net al verteld hebt. Hè? Dus uh, kom naar ons toe als er vragen zijn. Maar iedereen heeft als het goed is mijn telefoonnummer of wel eens een keertje gezien. Uh, als je vragen zijn of er is behoefte aan meer uitleg, kun je zeker contact met ons opnemen. En dan uh, gaan we weer verder.